Well, welcome back. Uh, thanks for joining us again here. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time today going through the business function of accounting. And accounting is uh, one of the most important functions in business, uh, not to downplay the importance of the others, uh, but it's extremely important. And a lot of people, when they hear the word accounting, instantly begin to yawn, maybe roll their eyes a little bit, and maybe even uh, have some hesitation uh, because it, it can be somewhat of an intimidating function because it does require some type of analysis and uh, use of numbers, uh, which depending upon your background, that may be something you're comfortable with. Uh, but for many of us, maybe that's not something that we necessarily gravitate towards automatically. Uh, but that's completely okay. Um, you don't necessarily need to be the best at accounting, but I do encourage all of my students, particularly those that are involved uh, in entrepreneurship and potentially starting their own businesses, to be at least familiar with some of the major components of accounting. By no means do you need to be an expert. However, you need to be able to tell the difference between revenues, expenses, and all those other things. Because if you decide to outsource your accounting function, meaning pay someone other than yourself to handle the accounting portion of your business, you need to be able to determine if they're doing a good job or not, if they're accounting for things accurately, if they are budgeting for things accurately, if what is a expense truly is an expense, if money that should be somewhere is actually there. And so that just kind of uh, describes the importance of knowing a little bit about accounting. So what we're going to be going through here, just to give you a little bit of a roadmap, is we're going to talk about what accounting is. I'm going to give you a working definition, uh, which is the same one as the one in your textbook, just so we're consistent. We're going to describe who accounting is for, uh, the different types of accounting, go into specific financial statements. Uh, so we're going to go through the three major financial statements that you'll come across. I'm going to tell you how to read these things. Uh, and then we're going to discuss uh, some of the latter uh, portions of accounting with budgeting and those types of things as well. Hopefully we'll address any questions comments or potential concerns that you may have after reading through the chapter on your own, which is certainly my advice to read through and then come to the lecture. That way you have at least a foundational knowledge of what we're talking about here. We can build upon it. If there's a little bit of confusion, hopefully we can get around that and make sure we get you to the point to where you have a solid understanding of what we're trying to talk about here. So uh, that's enough about why accounting is important. Uh, let's go into really what it is. And accounting really most basically is simply a system for recognizing, organizing, analyzing, and reporting a company's financial information. Okay? We would all agree that if you start your own business and if you sell things, you're obviously going to bring in money. But all of that money you're not going to be able to keep, right? Because if you, say for example, acquire products from someone and sell them to a consumer of some kind, obviously you had expenses to acquire those products. Or if you're in a service industry, you have expenses to provide that service. And so accounting allows us to recognize, okay, this is a revenue. This is money that we've brought in. Okay, this is expense. This is what I am paying. But also allows us to organize it in a way that makes sense. To take hundreds if not thousands of transactions and to organize them into revenues and expenses and not only just that but more specifically uh, what type of revenues what type of expenses analyze those meaning that we're going to take our financial statements and we're going to assess the health of our particular business how do we do that and then lastly reporting those producing the financial statements so that we can publish those to potentially investors uh, and also other people that have an interest in the financial well-being of our company. Okay, So hopefully that elaborates on the definition. There's four basic uh, kind of key terms in there, obviously recognizing, organizing, analyzing, and reporting that you need to key in on. But I just want to describe the definition further so you know where we're going with that. Okay, So make sure that you take good notes on this because sometimes it's not necessarily second nature, whereas some of these other functions you might pick up rather quickly. All right, so let's get into really who needs accounting. Why do we even care about it? Why do we teach it? Is it really just to bore you? Not necessarily. It does have a lot of value. So let's go through who needs it. Uh, 
Uh, first, obviously managers need it, right? If you have been in management with a company, you know that you need to know what it is that your business unit is selling? How much in sales are you producing? What are your expenses? Are you profitable, right? From a basic standpoint, if you are very profitable, then maybe that gives you the opportunity to maybe hire additional employees if there's a business need for it. Or when handing out raises at the end of the year, wouldn't you want to know if your business unit or company was profitable? If you're not, chances are you probably don't want to allow for raises. But if you are, that gives you some discretionary uh, income that you can then go ahead and dole out to employees for, for performance, of course. Uh, so managers certainly need to know what products are selling, uh, to what extent they're selling at, uh, what are their margins, meaning that uh, what is the difference that you take home, your revenues, less expenses, if you will. And so those are things that people need to know. If you're starting your own particular business, you want to know how much money am I keeping? What am I making on each and every sale? Okay. And so those are things that you'll want to know as a manager, and that is why they have a need for accounting information. In addition to managers, stockholders, investors, people that put money into your company potentially have a need for this type of information. Okay, As an investor, I want to see how a company is performing financially. Okay, I do uh, some investments kind of on the side just for my own, obviously, uh, utilizing the income that I have and making sure that obviously growing that. Uh, and so that requires me to kind of pour over these financial statements of these publicly traded companies, which they are accessible. If they're a publicly traded company, meaning their stock is traded openly on an open market of some type, they have to publish financial statements like your balance sheet, income statements, and statement of cash flows. Okay, And so investors can obviously gain access to that fairly easily. You can gain access to a publicly traded company's financial statements on like a Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, and other different investing sites. Uh, that allows you to get a, a kind of an overview of how the business is performing. How much money are they making? And then kind of develop trends and see, okay, the sales were this much this quarter, and now they are this much this quarter. There is a 10% increase. Obviously, that's good, but how much are they taking away? Uh, and so before you decide that you're going to put your hard-earned money into purchasing stock in a company, you want to make sure that they're financially sound, right? How much cash do they have? We're finding that especially in kind of the volatility of today's markets, uh, that companies with cash are, are really the ones that are performing better holistically, although generally maybe not, or more specifically, maybe not on a case-by-case -case basis. But those firms, those businesses are better able to weather the storm. If things get bad and customers go away, they have money available, they continue to operate. Okay. Uh, although it's always changing, uh, the latest report is that Apple has roughly about $118 billion in cash. Uh, more cash than anyone would probably ever need, and certainly more so than what Apple needs. They have enough cash to operate their company 11 years without making any money, meaning that they continue to produce products, continue to pay employees, pay for research and development, all these things, operate their particular business, and they don't have to sell anything. Okay, so that's a pretty good position, you would say, right? Obviously, if you don't have to earn an income for 11 years and you can do what it is that you do on a normal basis, that's a pretty good financial position. All right, employees. Okay, you may ask yourself, uh, why would employees, I work for a publicly traded company, why do I really care to see what they're in? They pay me every couple weeks or every month. I don't really have a need for this. Well, as we're finding with unemployment at historically high levels and continues to be, uh, and, and people obviously being laid off, not because they can't do their jobs, but because there's just not work for them and companies are downsizing, you should show an interest in how your employer is actually doing, right? This could be a good indication of if you should start searching for a job uh, versus you know, continuing to work in that particular job, okay? It's all about job security, okay? And so, being able to read financial statements will put you in a position to where you can have an accurate assessment over how your employer is performing so that you know 
it can kind of raise the red flag, so to speak, and you can start in your off hours looking for other sources of employment because potentially maybe your job may not be there. Also, a great way if you're looking at potentially working for a company to look at their financial statements. How are they performing, right? If they don't perform well, what do you think that's going to say in terms of bonuses and raises and promotions and different financial incentives that you would be able to receive? Probably not going to be there. Um, So make sure that that may be available to you. This is also a great way to negotiate raises is if you have access to the performance of your business unit, your company, and can prove that your individual contributions have obviously an impact on the overall performance of the company. All right, creditors, okay, people that provide money to businesses or dole out loans like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, JP Morgan, uh, those types of companies obviously have a, a significant need, right? Because they want to know, are you going to pay me back? I'm going to give you this $100 million loan uh, for a certain number of years. I need to assess whether or not you have the ability to pay me back. And so, of course, I'm going to require a lot of financial statements. Very similar to if you ever have applied for uh, maybe a mortgage or even a car loan, any type of loan whatsoever, they usually want you to prove your income, right? How much money do you make? And so we can do some calculations to determine how likely would you be to actually pay us back? Do you have any other debts, any other expenses that would inhibit you or prohibit you from being able to pay us back? Okay. Remember that banks are very good assessors of risk, right? They, they pay people like actuaries to determine how risky someone is. And so based upon some preset variables and criteria, they assess you on how risky you are and are usually pretty good at determining who is going to pay versus who is not usually. Uh, we've seen the, the recent housing bubble and, and obviously by opening it up to some pride lending and all those other things ha- has, has definitely had an impact on the economy for certain. Uh, but generally, they are good at assessing uh, risk uh, and those sorts of things. All right, suppliers. Okay, People that if you are a business that you get your products from. right? I have an image here of Foxconn, which is a supplier out of uh, China. And they provide uh, a lot of uh, supplies to companies like Apple, technology companies, a lot of the, the different things that go into um, or assembling uh, the iPhones and the iPads are done by Foxconn. And so Foxconn obviously wants to know if Apple has enough money to pay it, right? If Apple says, hey, we need to ramp up production on the new iPhone 5, uh, this, there, these are how many units that we want, this is the time frame that we need, Obviously, Foxconn wants to have reasonable assurance that Apple is going to be able to pay them, okay? And so, obviously, Apple does, uh, but you need to analyze that on a case-by-case basis, okay? So, suppliers, another group that has a definite interest in seeing that businesses have a financial means to pay because they're, yeah, what you probably don't know is a lot of business in the business-to-business market, which means businesses selling goods to businesses, a lot of the work is done on credit, meaning that they may provide the goods, whatever they may be, ahead of time, but they're not receiving payment until 30, 60 days later. Okay, so if you're going to part with a particular good without receiving payment, you probably want to have reasonable assurance that that particular group or business can pay you back. Lastly, government agencies. I alluded to this before, but agencies like the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, which is the SEC that I mentioned just seconds ago, have an interest in this information. Um, The SEC is in charge of basically reviewing the financial statements of, of different businesses, different publicly traded companies. And so they're in charge of making sure that these things are accurate so that when investors like you and I review these statements, we essentially can deem them as accurate and we can make decisions based upon them. Okay? Remember, the problem, if the, if the financial statement is not accurate, meaning that the numbers that are on the actual statement don't accu- accurately reflect what is going on with the business, then your decision is not going to be accurate as well. You can follow all of the methodology 
that you need to do to invest in that business, looking at P.E. ratios and earnings per share and how much cash is on hand and countless other different ratios. But if the numbers that you use aren't accurate, your decision is not going to be accurate. And so that's what government agencies do. They're designed to ensure the accuracy. Obviously, we don't necessarily like over-regulation, um, but the regulation is good. Not all regulation is bad, right? When I get on an airplane, I'd like the reasonable assurance to know that the airline that I'm riding on or flying on went through and checked certain things, right? That they followed a certain procedure to make sure that uh, they checked to have, you know, that for safety and those different things. You know, I, I, I had have comfort in that in knowing they they are regulated and have to follow certain guidelines that are designed to protect me uh, so although over, uh, regulation gets a bad rap not all regulation is bad and hopefully you certainly see some of the value in that all right so what do really accountants do let's go ahead and squash uh, some misconceptions and assumptions that aren't accurate okay there's a a large camp really and these are people that maybe don't have a, a great deal of background in accounting but view account counting as synonymous with bookkeeping okay uh, bookkeeping is part of accounting okay accounting would be the larger function and bookkeeping is merely one of the kind of items that are completed in that function okay uh, bookkeeping really involves the day-to-day -day, the actual categorizing and organizing of tasks and things like that where accounting goes further is you actually analyze the statements you know interpret them right what do they mean okay they're not necessarily just bean counters they provide analysis over what it means what does it mean when your earnings per share is you know uh, 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 110 or what does it mean when your PE ratio uh, is you know thirteen dollars and forty cents they provide meaning to what the numbers say they read in between the lines uh, which is certainly the value there uh, accountants also do a lot of presentations uh, you'd be surprised you think people with that enjoy numbers might not be uh, you know obviously be that in the front and you know presenting information and those types of things uh, but they do a great deal of presenting information to you know different executives in the company and external stakeholders and those types of people All right, so we're going to talk about the two different types of accounting. I know we were talking about accounting in general, but there are two different types. Luckily, they're not that difficult to understand, and we're going to spend more time on financial accounting than we are managerial accounting. We're not going to spend that much time on it. It gets a little bit of uh, mention in your book, uh, not a significant deal, uh, but we're going to focus primarily on financial accounting in this particular lecture here. Uh, so financial accounting is accounting that's designed to address the needs of external stakeholders. External stakeholders. So a couple questions you might be sitting there and asking. What's a stakeholder? Okay, A stakeholder is someone who has an interest or stake in the performance of your company. Okay, So just real quick, you might want to think about, okay, well, who are stakeholders? Well, take a specific company and think who has an interest in people or in their success well obviously employees would right employees would for sure right they want to make sure their jobs are secure and they're gonna be able to return to work the next day and earn an income to pay for things that's generally good uh, also investors have a need for this information okay suppliers creditors government agencies now there's one component though that you're probably keying in on and that's external external stakeholders okay an internal stakeholder will be someone that actually has an interest in the company but works within the company okay but financial accounting serves external stakeholders okay people outside of the company that may not have all of the intricate understanding of the business because they don't work there and handle the day-to-day -day. they still have an interest though which is very very important okay now, uh, what financial accounting, among other things, primarily does is, and this is uh, Qualcomm, I kind of skipped ahead, is an example of external stakeholder. They are a supplier. They provide a lot of the different chips and things that are used in electronics devices. So they would be an example of an external stakeholder. Sorry, I jumped ahead there. 
So back to financial accounting though. One of the, one of the key things that is produced out of financial accounting uh, are income statements or financial statements, if you will. Okay? And financial statements provide uh, broad information, an overview, if you will, of the financial performance or the financial position of a company. And the three primary statements that we're going to get into are income statements, balance sheets, and the statement of cash flows. Okay, there are more. There are like statements of retained earnings and uh, a few others, but we're not necessarily going to get into those. We're going to go into the most common ones here. So uh, before we go into the different statements, uh, I do want to mention what are known as generally accepted accounting principles. Okay. Uh, and generally accepted accounting principles were created to ensure consistency. Okay? Imagine the difficulty of every single company using a different method to account for its revenues. Right? Am I supposed to account for my revenue as soon as once I sell something? Right? When someone clicks buy on their computer? Is that in, do I count it as revenue for purposes of my financial statements? Or do I have to wait? until they actually get the product or can I count it as revenue when the product is shipped you know those are questions that you need to ask yourself and so in order to ensure consistency what what we've designed uh, the uh, financial accounting standards board has designed generally accepted accounting principles to ensure that companies are using the same method as one another or a similar method as one another Okay, and that provides a number of different benefits, some of which you're probably already gathering at this point. Um, so uh, let's kind of go into how that essentially helps. Um, I'm not going to go into too much specifics over the different types of accounting, like uh, last in, first out inventory, or first in, first out, and how you budget for the inventory you receive. It's really outside of the scope of this course. Um, if you take maybe an accounting uh, course, uh, that's designed to go over that specifically like an accounting uh, 1A. Some colleges and universities refer to it as accounting 4A, maybe even 4B or 1B. Uh, but we're not going to go into that much detail. So if you're interested in accounting, sorry, but you can certainly gather that information on your own and take additional coursework for that. So what do generally accepted accounting principles help us with? Okay, The first of which is they help ensure that we are getting relevant information, okay? Information that is important, okay? I wanna make sure and I get information that is vital to the decisions that I'm going to make. I don't want information that is useless, okay? And generally accepted accounting principles help ensure that we're getting relevant information. Next, reliable. Very, very important part. Is this reliable? Are the you know, revenues, what they say or what the company represents they are. Can I trust them? Okay. Reliability also deals with the fact that are they the same, right? Are we using information or accounting for our expenses uh, in ways that are similar over a period of time? You know, investors need to be able to rely on the information if they're going to make decisions. The same thing with all the other external and internal stakeholders. All right. Consistent. How frustrating would it be if a company you invested with changed repeatedly how they account for revenues? Maybe one quarter. Okay? And when I say quarter, uh, usually for financial purposes, an entire year is divided up into quarters. So every four months, uh, I'm sorry, or three months. Uh, so that would represent one particular quarter. So I'm sorry if I kind of glanced over that little detail there. Uh, but consistency has to deal with are they the same? Are, is the company using the same method to account for when they take money in, when they bring in revenue, right? It would be frustrating if one quarter a, a company decided that they were going to go ahead and say, well, as soon as the customer actually authorizes a transaction, we're going to account for revenues, okay? So that maybe it boosts revenues one quarter when in reality we really haven't received the money and may not actually because... You know, obviously some customers don't end up paying or don't have the means to pay and all those other things and maybe debit cards bounce and those types of things. Uh, but the next quarter, we're going to say, well, we're going to allocate it. Uh, we're, we're doing pretty, pretty good financially. Our sales are pretty good, so investors are going to be happy. So we're just going to go ahead and account for our revenues when we actually ship the product. Okay? 
wouldn't be a good thing because once again your information isn't going to be reliable because it, the chip method of which it's uh, accounted for changes all the time so it needs to be consistent and that's what the uh, generally accepted accounting principles helps to do next comparable this compar comparability factor is very very important this piece is very important because you want to be able to compare companies right particularly companies within the same industry right you'd want to be able to compare a company like McDonald's with another company like Burger King okay and 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 f with the companies following generally accepted accounting principles that allows you to do that so you know that one company is not using drastically different accounting methods compared to another and then you really can't compare the two because they're accounting for revenues and expenses and earnings differently and, and which can be very very frustrating and so those four areas are extremely important and, and are areas that the uh, generally accepted accounting principles help to remedy so that investors like you and I can make sure and make accurate decisions. Okay, so moving on here, we're going to go into some of the different financial statements. Uh, so we're going to get into kind of the, the meat and potatoes portion of uh, this particular lecture unit. So what I encourage you to do is if you're kind of on information overload, you know, listen to it in pieces. Don't feel the need to go through the entire 60-minute session. Uh, there's a lot of information there. Remember, I usually present this over an entire week span. So we're talking three separate 50-minute uh, uh, sessions, if not four. Uh, some I can do in two, but generally it's three, some are four. Uh, so make sure that you're pacing yourself. Obviously, we have a little bit more discussion in my face-to-face -face courses that I teach, uh, but this is really me just kind of, uh, you know, dumping information on you. Um, so, you know, pace yourself. Don't go through it all. You have really an entire week, usually, if you're taking this as part of a course uh, to get through everything. So don't feel the need to crank everything out in in one hour, unless you really want to, and that's completely up to you, but just be be considerate of, of, you know, obviously absorbing the information. Don't just check a box. It really, it's important that you learn it. So a uh, little bit of a uh, kind of an off-ramp or segue there, but uh, a balance sheet is one of the financial statements that we were talking about, one of the very important ones that we're going to discuss, okay? And a balance sheet is designed to, I'm sorry, summarize a firm's financial position at a specific, specific point in time. Okay, so a balance sheet is only reliable uh, as of the day that it's produced. And when you look at these statements, I'm going to show you an example. It'll say as of and a certain date, meaning that the next day it might be different. Okay, and so the other statements summarize performance over a given period of time. Balance sheets are summarizing a financial position of a company at a specific point in time. So make sure that you can make that distinction very, very important. So let's get into the specifics. What are the components of balance sheets? First one is you have assets. Okay. Brief explanation. Assets are things that a company owns that have value. Okay. And so you're probably thinking right now, what are things that a company can own that has value? Well, there's a few images here that give you some examples. Okay. Uh, cash obviously has value, right? It's easy to assess. Equipment, things you purchase like buildings, trucks, automobiles that are under the name of the business obviously have some value, okay? Uh, and also uh, things that aren't tangible, intangible assets, meaning that you cannot hold them physically, you can't smell them and all those other things do have value as well. And those are typically intellectual property, things like copyrights, Okay, uh, patents, trademarks, right? The, the McDonald's logo um, has value. It's not a tangible thing, right? But it has value, right? There, people recognize the golden arches, maybe certain uh, slogans, if you will, right? If I was to uh, name a, a particular slogan or, or kind of read one off, you can probably tell me, okay, it's for this particular company, okay? Like the best part of waking up is, and you can probably finish that, uh, which is obviously the kind of kind of tagline of Folgers. That would be an example of an intangible asset has value, but it's not 
tangible. Okay, so those are things that would would go into one section of a balance sheet, and we're going to go over specifically some other line items and how the balance sheet's organized as far as assets go. Uh, notice though that it says assets, and it has an equal sign next to it for this next box. Okay, and I'm going to go into that in a little detail in a second here. Uh, so assets equals liabilities plus something else, and we'll get to that. Uh, but liabilities are things that a company owes to non-owners. Okay, and so in a publicly traded company or in any company, uh, owners are people that have stock in the company, and so they're partial owners, right? So obviously, non-owners could be people like banks, right? If the company takes out a loan and owes a bank or another institution money, uh, then obviously that would be represented as a liability. Also, having to pay your employees, right? You know that you're going to have to pay your employees in two weeks. And so you have to account for that on your balance sheet. You know the expense is coming up. It's not like it was a surprise and all of a sudden, hey, it's been two weeks. That went by fast. I forgot I have to pay you. Probably wouldn't be a good way of running a business. Okay, uh, But you have to account for that expense. It goes as what's called wages payable. Right? You're going to pay, obviously, wages. Okay, uh, And if a... If a company issues, let's say, a bond, a, a corporate bond, which is like an IOU, it's an agreement to pay, uh, it, it's sold to investors who purchase that, and they purchase it for a, a dollar amount, usually what's called a par value, or uh, it can be sold above or below. We'll get into that when we talk about financial securities and markets. Uh, but that also represents a liability. It's a thing that you have to pay eventually at some point in time, some sooner than others. And we'll get into how those are organized on the balance sheet in a couple minutes. And next, owner's equity. Okay, so if you're following along with the basic equation, you'll notice that assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Okay, they always match. Okay, if they don't, you did something wrong because they always match. And the reason for that is a company has two ways of of financing its operations, either debt or borrowing money or going to owners and getting money from them. Two ways. Okay, It's not going to go out and earn an income and those different types of things. It has to get the money from somewhere to further its operations. Always has to balance. Okay, And we're going to go over, when we talk about debt versus equity financing, uh, we'll go over the, the different options there. Uh, but back to owner's equity. Owner's equity is the claims that owners have against their firm's assets or the company. Okay, So if you hold stock in McDonald's and you have 22 shares or 25 or 50 shares or whatever of McDonald's stock, okay, I don't know why I mentioned 22. That's kind of a weird number to throw out there, but whatever. Uh, so let's just say you have 100 shares just to make things easy. Uh, you then have a claim against that company's assets. Okay. That, those shares give you voting rights, of course, uh, but McDonald's sold those shares in the open market, okay, initially, to generate money, okay? So if they issue new shares for, let's say, $100 a share, and I buy, um, let's say, a handful of them, they, I give them, let's say I buy five, I'm giving them $500, and I get a piece of paper. Nowadays, they don't even issue a piece of paper, right? Uh, but they used to. But I get uh, essentially uh, something saying that, not even something tangible, but I have a claim against their assets. But there's something to keep in mind. Those claims are secondary to liabilities, meaning that if a company goes under, what will usually happen is it will sell all of its assets, okay? And then it's going to pay its liabilities first. So the people that have loans and have bonds and those types of things, if there's anything left over, then it will go to people that have owner's equity. So one thing I'll mention is although it's a claim against a firm's assets, it is uh, secondary, if you will, meaning that obviously there are the uh, claims of the bondholders and people that have loans outstanding that come first. Anything remaining will go to shareholders, which is why it's riskier, right? It's a riskier investment. It's not guaranteed, uh, which is why people are kind of turned off by the stock market sometimes because that's not a guaranteed return on their investment. It could go lower. 
All right, so let's take a look at a, a balance sheet here. And this is a fictitious balance sheet for a company called Big Bucks, uh, I believe. Whoops, let's not go too far. Uh, I believe this may be in your textbook, or at least it should. I try to keep things consistent so that you're looking at things multiple times. Um, but you'll notice that it's organized in a certain way. Directly at the top here, you'll see balance sheet, and it has a date, December 31st of 20-whatever, uh, meaning that this is accurate as of December 31st on a particular year, on a specific year. And the way that balance sheets are organized, you have your assets up top, you have liabilities, and then owner's equity below. Uh, and they're organized in order of uh, liquidity or how quickly you have to pay them or can gain access to them. And I'll explain what I mean. So look at current assets. Okay, You'll see that current assets has a couple of different uh, lines there. Uh, first is cash. Okay, Cash is the most liquid currency, right? Obviously, if you have cash, you can spend it right away. Okay, You don't have to wait. It's yours. You can spend it on whatever you want. Okay, so cash is listed first because it's the most liquid. Companies can do things right away with it. Next, you have what's called accounts receivable. Okay, and accounts receivable are things that you have sold to uh, suppliers or customers and extended on credit. So you've sold them something, you provided them with a good or service, but you haven't received the actual payment yet. Okay, so maybe you're expecting payment in 30 days. Uh, maybe you've uh, outlined uh, additional credit terms, whatever it is. Uh, and so that's money that that $187,000 we are expecting to receive but have not, right? So hopefully we get that, but it's, we're, it's not a for sure thing. Uh, companies write off billions and billions of dollars uh, for goods that they provided but have not received payment for. And so companies will try to collect, even if it means selling an account to a collections agency for a little bit, and then they obviously will pursue the delinquent account. Inventory. Okay, obviously things that the company owns like uh, goods or, or uh, products that they've purchased and they have not sold yet. So let's say you were, we're talking about a retailer. Let's say Big Bucks is a retailer and they obviously acquire or have $396,000 worth of products. Okay, products that haven't been sold, uh, but they have them in their possession and they have value of some type. So they account for those on the balance sheet. Uh, you total those up and that gives you your total current assets. Okay, current assets are assets, anything that can be converted to cash within one year. Okay, so if you can convert it to cash or it is cash, you can convert it relatively easily, less than a year, it counts as a current asset. Anything over that is a, uh, is a uh, I'm sorry, uh, kind of a long-term asset, if you will. Um, obviously things uh, like plant, uh, property, equipment, uh, you can't convert it, obviously. It has value in its own right. Uh, so let's look at that line item. We have plant, property, and equipment. Okay, So any type of equipment, whether if it were construction, you know, we have bulldozers and cranes and those types of things, uh, or buildings themselves, um, those obviously have value. And so we account for those. Okay, uh, Notice below that it has depreciation. And depreciation... The best way I can explain that is let's say you bought a brand new 2012 uh, Ford F-150. We'll just go American for the time being and say you get a Ford F-150. Okay, uh, Let's just say for all intents and purposes it costs you 30 grand, although it probably is going to cost you a little more than that depending upon what you do. Uh, but let's just say you, you pay $30,000 for it. Okay, And do you think that truck's going to be worth $30,000 after a year? Probably not, right? You're saying probably hopefully, but probably not, right? When you drive it off the lot, you're going to lose money already. That's just common common knowledge, okay? What about two years or three, oh, four, five, ten, fifteen, if you even drive the truck that long? And so that's what depreciation is. You can't claim that truck as a $30,000 asset because you're going to put mileage on it, right? It's going to get dinged up. There's going to be wear and tear. It's not worth the same as it is, right? Try and sell that truck for $30,000 in five years. People are probably going to laugh at you, okay? So 
that depreciation means that we're going to depreciate the asset. We're going to claim it as less. Uh, a very common method of depreciation is what's called straight line depreciation. It's very, very simple to do. They also have accelerated depreciation, which you kind of uh, backload or, or front load the depreciation of an asset. But uh, what I'm going to show you is, is simply what's known as uh, straight line depreciation. And so how you do that, let's say we're going to take our $30,000 truck and we say, you know what, we're going to drive this thing pretty rough. Oh, I can probably get five years out of this thing. That's, that's really all I'm going to get out of it. And then I'm going to have to re-upgrade because my workers just really just beat this thing to all heck and it's not going to be worth that much. So I say five years and then I have to replace it with something new. Okay. And after the five years, I think that I can probably get, let's say, five grand for it. Okay. We'll just keep things simple. Okay. Uh, so I can recover $5,000. Okay. So what you do is you take that $30,000, you subtract $5,000 from it because that's what you can obtain. That's what we call a salvage value, right? What you can get for it when you're getting rid of it. And now we have $25,000. Okay. Now what we do, if we're going to do a straight line depreciation method, what that means is we account for depreciation the same amount each of the five years. So if we divide our $25,000 by five years, we know that we have to depreciate our asset $5,000 a year. Okay. So after year one, instead of claiming that it's worth $30,000, we're going to claim it's worth $25,000. And then we're going to claim it's worth 20 and then 15 10, 5, and then eventually we're going to get rid of that. So that's just a way of accounting for the asset. We don't want to claim, we don't want to overinflate what we owe in assets or what we own in assets. We want to account for things properly. So hopefully that provides a little bit of explanation there for it. Uh, hopefully I didn't confuse you further. Uh, by all means, get in contact with me and I can help clarify uh, if need be. So let's move on to assets. Okay. Uh, first thing we have here are, or I'm sorry, liabilities. I don't know where I'm reading. Uh, the first thing we have here are what we refer to as current liabilities. Okay. Uh, current liabilities are things that we essentially, oops, let's not go that far here real quick. Sorry, for some reason I'm skipping ahead. So current liabilities. Uh, current liabilities are things that we owe that we're going to have to pay within one year, right? Sticking with the same thing, just like current assets, except for we have to pay these, okay? So accounts payable. This is the same thing as accounts receivable, only it's flipped. This is money that we owe to people and we have to pay, right? Remember that businesses a lot of times buy things on credit. So I will pay you back in 30 days if I acquire these particular items here, whatever they may be. Okay, so I have to pay that. I should budget for it. It's money that I'm going to have to spend. It's not really a surprise if you can obviously t allocate for it. Next, we have wages payable, right? Wages that are coming due in less than a year. We obviously need to make sure there's money set aside to pay our employees. Very, very important. Uh, adding those two up, you get total current liabilities, right? Everything that you're going to owe potentially within one year. All right, next we have long-term liabilities. Long-term liabilities are things that you owe but are greater than a year. And so long-term liabilities can be uh, debt that you're going to pay, like loans that are going to be paid at a, a certain period of time. Uh, obviously, if you issue corporate bonds, you have to pay that back at some point in time, although those can be 10, 15, 20 potentially years. So that's long-term. And so adding up those areas will get you your total liability. So all of the things that you owe, whether they are due in less than a year or greater than a year. Uh, next, we're going to get to stockholders equity. Okay. Uh, you can see here that we have common stock. Uh, this is the value of the shares that, not the value, but what we sold the shares for. Okay. If I were to buy uh, shares of, well, let's just say Dell computers, and I purchase them on the open market, understand that Dell does not receive that money. Okay, That goes to somebody else who owned shares of Dell and wanted to sell and get out of their position. Okay, um, 
Dell would only receive money if they do what's called an initial public offering, commonly abbreviated as IPO, meaning that they decide, hey, we want to give up this percentage of our company. Let's sell this these many shares so we can get money. After the IPO, Dell does not receive any money from that unless they issue another more shares. Okay, uh, so if you purchase shares in Starbucks, Dell, Walmart, whomever, notice note that they're not getting that money. That's going to another investor who wanted to sell and get out of that position. Okay, uh, so common stock is the value or what uh, Dell, let's say, just for sake of keeping things simplistic, uh, owes or what they paid for that particular to to get that money. Okay, uh, and so if if they issued, uh, let's say, 300,000 shares at a dollar per share. Uh, that is their essential common stock right there. Okay. Uh, retained earnings. Retained earnings are is money that the business actually gets, right? We have revenues. They pay expenses. This is money that the company actually keeps. And so you essentially reinvest it in your business, right? Similarly to if you earn an income, you pay your bills and, and food and all those other things throughout the course of the month, and then you have a little bit of money left over, and you roll that money over to the next month. Very similar to how retained earnings work. The company is keeping that to use for the future. They're not paying it to shareholders as a dividend. Okay, So you add those two areas together, and you get total stockholders' equity. Some balance sheets might abbreviate it or might mention it as total shareholders' equity, essentially the same thing. All right, uh, finally getting through the end of this one. Uh, lastly, you have total liabilities and stockholders' equity. And notice that those two amounts add up to what are total assets. Okay, So they always equal one another. Uh, you can instantly tell if something is off if the amounts do not equal uh, each other. Okay, So that's a, a quick kind of check and balance to find out if you're doing things accurately. Okay. All right, we're going to go on to income statements. Uh, if your you know, head hurts from just all the information we've gone over, feel free and press pause here and come back. Uh, we're, I'm going to keep going here and go through income statements, and we can get to statement of cash flows and everything. So uh, first thing, the income statement uh, is a summary of a firm's operations over a given period of time. Now, remember that with the balance sheet, it summarizes a firm's financial position at a specific point in time. This is over a certain period of time. And so you'll have income statements that are for a quarterly basis, right? Summarizing what the firm did over a, a three-month span. And you have income statements that are over a annual basis, what they did the entire fiscal year. Okay, so you can, depending upon how long of a time period you have, you obviously you would gather different information and have different dollar amounts. So let's take a look at the components of an income statement. Uh, there are some general components that are very basic. First of which we have is revenue. Okay, and obviously this is earned from what the firm sells, right? The increase in the amount of the assets that the firm earns. Uh, and so if a company sells in a given quarter, you know, uh, 10,000 units of something at, at $10 per unit, their revenue would be $100,000 because you multiply, obviously, how much of a, how much of a product you sold multiplied by uh, the uh, dollar amount of what you sold each unit for, okay? And so uh, essentially, uh, how many products you sold by what you sold them for, okay? Very, very simple. And that would be your revenues. But you also have to take out your expenses, okay? And this is what a company spends uh, to actually acquire the assets that it's going to sell. And so if you're a retailer like Walmart, uh, those products on Walmart shelves didn't magically show up there. Uh, Walmart uh, didn't actually produce those in the warehouses and all those other things. Uh, they acquired them from someone else. They paid suppliers to get the electronics there and the clothing and the household items and the food and all those other things. And those represent expenses because they had to pay for them initially in order to acquire them to go ahead and resell to consumers like you and I. And after that, you have net income. Uh, this is commonly referred to as the kind of profit or loss. Uh, and and uh, you know, the income statements are commonly referred to as a, as a P&L, profit and loss statement, because it shows you 
if you earned money or if you didn't, right? And obviously, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that you want to be earning money, right? You want to be in the black, uh, as they say uh, in, in business. And so uh, the goal would be obviously to maximize net income and or profits to make sure that we retain as much money as possible uh, because that's good, what's going to allow you to continue to grow your business and to put more money into it to hire and all those other things. If you're not making any money, it doesn't, it's not going to be too long of a time before you can't operate anymore because you're essentially, uh, more money is leaving your organization that is coming in. So let's look at an income statement here real quick. Uh, notice that there's a couple of things here. Uh, first of which is it says for year ending December 31st. Uh, so obviously this is for the entire year, uh, January 1st of that year to the very, very end. Okay, This, this would be an annual income statement for big bucks, of course, sticking with that same thing. Uh, so first you have revenues, okay? Obviously the money that's brought in from selling goods and, ser and or services. Uh, next you have cost of goods sold, okay? You might also see cost of goods manufactured. Uh, that's for a manufacturing type company. Uh, cost of, uh, of revenue or cost of sales. If it's a service company, right? They're not acquired goods. They're used, they essentially mean the same thing, okay? Uh, but depending upon the business, the market, the industry, they might use different terms. So in this case, we know that Big Bucks is in the business of selling goods because we have costs of goods sold, okay? So they spent $550,000 on goods, leaving them with what's called a gross profit of $340,000, okay? Pretty easy. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. There are additional expenses, right? Businesses don't just pay to acquire goods. They also pay for other stuff too, okay? Uh, and so we also have selling expenses and administrative expenses, okay? Uh, selling expenses are expenses that are you incur as a result of selling goods and services. And so typically this involves uh, marketing expenses, right? For advertising typically involves uh, salesperson's salaries uh, in the event that you have salespeople. Obviously, they had to try and sell the particular product and or service there. And so they obviously need to be paid. Uh, that needs to be allocated as an expense there. Okay. Uh, next, you have administrative expenses, right? Administrative expenses is commonly referred to as kind of your overhead. These are people that are involved in the operations of your business that don't necessarily interact with customers or physically sell the products and services. Uh, people like managers, for example, right? Managers are, are essentially overhead. Uh, they don't like to think so, but they, they kind of are because they don't directly sell the goods and services. Uh, administrative staff like secretaries, receptionists, and positions that are similar to that are examples of administrative expenses because they're not actually involved in selling the goods or services, but they obviously provide value, of course. Uh, so those two areas make up your operating expenses, okay? And what is left after that uh, constitutes what's referred to as your operating profit, okay? So your profit after factoring out all of your expenses for operations and then all of your expenses for uh, cost of goods sold. Uh, so next thing you have to do, uh, and this has net operating income, it can be referred to as net operating profit as well. Terms are used interchangeably, so don't let that confuse you. Uh, next, we pay for things like interest and taxes. Okay, and if you're uh, in the accounting field, you might also refer to the term uh, uh, E or the acronym EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. That is kind of operating profit. Um, also factors out depreciation and amortization, which we're not going to get into here. Uh, so don't really worry about that unless you're an accounting person, in which case you will have to. So uh, looking here, we have an interest expense, right? So we probably have some type of debt, loans probably, that we have to pay interest on a, a monthly basis. And so just like you or I, if we go out and get a, a mortgage or a car loan or any other type of loan, we have to pay interest on that, right? The banks don't want to give away money for free. Uh, and so that is an expense of $12,000, okay? Now we have our taxable income, earnings before taxes. Uh, and then obviously corporations have to pay taxes too. So we have $62,000 going to that. That gives us our net income and or profit. 
Uh, they're used interchangeably, which is $101,000, okay? Now, notice here that there's also another line item for dividends, okay? Uh, dividends we're going to get into a little more when we talk about financial markets, uh, but a dividend is a payment to shareholders. Essentially, some companies want to reward their shareholders on a quarterly basis and say, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars for just investing in our company. Not all companies pay dividends, okay? Uh, Growth stocks, technology stocks, sometimes don't because they reinvest that money back in their company. Uh, but more established companies uh, will pay a dividend. And so that's a payment to shareholders. So obviously that's an expense. And the rest is going to go to our retained earnings, which is money that we're keeping. It's money that's left over at the end of the month, or in this case year, that we're going to reinvest back in our company. So very, very uh, important part there. Hopefully that provides you some information there. All right, next thing, moving right along. Uh, once again, if you need to stop, feel free, go ahead. We'll be right back here when you pick up. Uh, next thing is a statement of cash flows, okay? A statement of cash flows uh, essentially summarizes a firm's, uh, how it spends and receives its cash over a given period of time. Remember that cash is king, okay? And the quicker that I can get something like an accounts receivable to cash, the better I'm going to be in because if I don't have it as cash, I can't do anything with it. So my options are very, very limited. Uh, and so as an investor, you're going to want to know how much cash a company has, but also how does it get it and where is it going? Okay, and that's really what the statement of cash flows tries to do. Very similar to an income statement in that it summarizes cash over a given period of time, not a specific point in time, of course. So let's go into the different nuances of the statement of cash flows. Uh, this one will probably move through a little quicker here. Uh, first, you have operating activities. Okay, An operating activity is either cash that is received or spent on the sale of goods and or services. Okay, So if you spend money to acquire goods to later resell, that is essentially an operating activity. Okay, And obviously, if you spent more money on goods and or services than you uh, received from selling them, uh, you would have a, a negative cash flow in this particular area. But you know that might be okay because maybe you spent a lot more money acquiring things, so it looks bad one in one quarter, but you're later reselling them at another quarter. Uh, next thing we have is investing activities. And investing activities is cash that's received or spent from fixed or long-term assets. Okay, uh, Fixed assets meaning things that have value that don't move anywhere. right? So we're typically talking about property, land, buildings, those types of things. Those are obviously very long-term. Uh, obviously, long-term assets can also be uh, things like equipment. Okay, Obviously, they move, but they're typically going to use them for a long period of time or at least greater than a year. Um, so if you're spending money on buying equipment and trucks and property, or if you're selling equipment, property, those types of things, that may represent a, a positive or negative uh, in that area. All right, next we have, and lastly, operating activities. And operating activities are cash that flows inside or, or into or out of the company from basically issuing or purchasing additional shares or long-term loans, okay? Uh, and so if you go ahead and if you issue stock uh, in your particular company and you go ahead and you decide you want to sell some ownership of your company to investors, uh, that can potentially be a operating activity. Obviously, that'd be money that you received that you didn't originally have. Um, also, if you decide that, you know what, we have a lot of cash and we really want to buy back some of our shares. So uh, maybe they're lower in value, so we're getting kind of a discount on them. Uh, we decide that we're going to go ahead and take some of the money that we have and then we're just going to go ahead and we're going to purchase those. That obviously would be a cash outflow. So it would be an expense and that would be calculated as such, of course. And so those are uh, certainly things that you need to uh, need to consider here is, uh, is that particular area. Uh, one thing I just noticed, I'm going to kind of backtrack here real quick. 
is this last one is incorrect and I was just kind of thumbing through something to check. Uh, this shouldn't be operating activities if you're following along and I guess I can say that I was just making sure that you were paying attention which isn't accurate. Uh, this should be financing activities okay? because operating activities obviously we're dealing with obtaining goods uh, to later resell them. Uh, this is financing activity so I'm sorry that I misled you. It was not uh, uh, was not intentional, uh, but I was just going off of the slide here that I created, and so I was assuming that the information I provided was accurate, which is not the case. Hopefully everything else is right. So uh, this is financing activity, so it still deals with obviously purchasing shares or selling shares on the open market and that those types of things. Uh, so here is a statement real quick for big bucks, okay, and as you can see here, uh, we have operating cash flow, so this is money that we essentially received. Uh, so we have cash payments from customers, customers paying us for goods and or services. Uh, we had to purchase the inventory, we have additional expenses, and we have a actual inflow of $73,000 here. Uh, moving on to the next section, we have our investing cash flow. Remember that the investing cash flow is obviously uh, from purchasing uh, equipment and assets or selling them. In this case, we sold some land for 50000 but we also purchased equipment for 85000 And what that means, obviously, is we spent or cash of thir in the amount of $35,000 left our organization. Uh, and then next, financing cash flow. Okay, looks like we actually uh, went ahead and had an increase in long-term bank loans. So we took money out from banks. And so we received $63,000. Obviously, that represents debt. We have to pay interest on it, but we did receive the cash up front. Uh, and then we paid out money to investors in the form of dividends. Um, so that would be classified as an expense, in which case we have $8,000 in uh, cash received as a result of our financing activities. And simply you can follow along and see that you add up the three areas and determine uh, how much cash that you received, add that to the amount of cash that you started with at the beginning of the period, in this case, beginning of the year, and you have your cash balance at the end of the period. So ideally you would see that the company is receiving more cash over time. Um, if they're investing heavily in property, equipment, different things, Obviously, you're going to see some cash leaving the organization. It may not be a bad thing, but you would want to take a look at that just to figure out why and where it's going. It's not bad that it's leaving, but you need to see why. Where is it going and is that going to add value? All right, a couple other things here real quick. We're going to get into kind of the analyzing part of these statements. Hopefully, you have a better understanding of how the statements work. If you need to go back and listen to this, I encourage you to, to make sure I understand this. Uh, but we also need to interpret them, meaning that what do they mean? There's a couple things that we can do to actually go through with that. Uh, first thing is when companies issue financial uh, reports and, and annual reports, things they have to produce on a yearly basis as a result of requirements imposed by the SEC, uh, they need to get an independent auditor's report. And what that is, is they have, they get an independent review from an external, right? Independent, meaning that the company does not work for them. Okay. That's a conflict of interest, right? If you're paying the accounting firm and they work for you, or if it's done internally, they would have an interest in seeing that the information is presented in a positive light. So instead, you have an independent auditor's report, and that is an external company that's supposed to review the information and sign off on everything. Companies like uh, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, and KPMG are examples of auditors that review statements, uh, review books, take a look at inventories, make sure that what the company is claiming on the statements is actually what really exists. Very, very important. So they verify the financial statements. They'll examine the accounting methods the company used to actually organize and present the data. They'll look at invoices and sales receipts and different things to justify revenues. Maybe even conduct physical inventory counts, right? Going to warehouses and making sure, well, the company says they have this. Let's see if it's accurate. Uh, and they can issue a couple of opinions. Uh, they can issue an unqualified uh, unqualified, a qualified, or an adverse opinion. Uh, really, the most important one to note is what's called an adverse opinion. And, and adverse opinions, they don't happen very, very often there. But an adverse opinion essentially is 
uh, the independent auditor found something that is alarming that the investor needs to be aware of uh, that is a red flag. Uh, and so it's, it's something that will obviously shine some negative light on the financial records. Uh, they may have allocated for inventory improperly or used an accounting method that wasn't used before. Um, so those types of things will raise alarm. Okay, uh, Firms can also, or auditors can also issue what are called unqualified uh, opinions. And an unqualified position uh, is basically saying that, you know what, there were some minor issues, but it's not really going to affect the financial statements. There's, it's really not a big deal. You shouldn't be very concerned about it. And then lastly, you have a qualified opinion, meaning that, you know, this is accurate. We have no concerns and, and there's no issues there. So those are the things to look for. And you can read those in annual reports and you have access to those. You can get those uh, via Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, different internet sites, uh, and really read through those. They're fairly lengthy. Uh, so chances are you won't want to, but you know, if you have an interest in just taking a look and, and seeing that, you know, feel free to. All right, next you have financial statement notes. And I have here an example of uh, financial statement notes. But let me get back to uh, this information here. Uh, financial statement notes uh, are essentially uh, little notes on the financial statements that explain certain things. Uh, and so they could be important. Uh, they could help elaborate on certain things. You may see on some financial statements little numbers uh, that are pretty that are next to larger numbers, and that usually is referring you to something else to help explain something and elaborate on something. Um, so that's not a bad idea to take a look at those because they can provide additional understanding on what it is that's being presented. They can help clarify certain numbers. If there was a big expense somewhere, they might have a note saying this is a one-time expense, uh, so obviously it's not reoccurring, uh, those types of things. They can indicate if they changed the accounting method. If there was a lawsuit uh, that is pending, they might uh, you know, increase a certain expense area. And so those are things to look for. Another area is the management's discussion and analysis portion uh, in which the actual corporate managers will go ahead and give their two cents about the statements. They'll provide their analysis, uh, which is always good to hear, and you want to hear that perspective. Now, obviously, they might be overly positive, uh, but at the same time, you certainly want to hear what they have to say if they're going to provide any other useful information. Uh, now, this is an example of, obviously, uh, a particular statement. Uh, this here is an income statement, of course. Uh, and so you see on the bottom here, they have those little footnotes that are in the smaller text there. Um, that's an example of those types of notes I was referring to that you will want to take a look at just to provide some information to you. All right, next thing are comparative statements. Okay, uh, Comparative statements really basically are just multiple statements issued side by side. Uh, and the SEC requires that publicly traded companies provide comparative financial statements so you can compare how a company has performed over a period of time. And so usually what they do is they have two to three years of figures that are side by side. And that allows you to chart trends. You can see when things go up and things go down and where the overall market is moving. Uh, and so as you can see from this example here, uh, we have the trend from 03, 04, and 05. So you can see you know, roughly uh, what the net sales were in 05 compared to 04 compared to 03. And they're going up, which is great. That's obviously good. But you can also drill down further and find out, okay, where, is, where are the profits going? If you look here, you see net income is going up. That's also a good thing. But there may be something else behind that. Uh, so once again, this just provides investors with another resource so they can compare multiple uh, different statements over a period of time to see where the trend is. All right, so that kind of summarizes our discussion of financial accounting. Hopefully that clarifies some things. If not, feel free to re-listen to the lecture or get in contact with me, and I'd be happy to explain things uh, further uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, one thing I will mention is sometimes it's very difficult to coordinate uh, via email, uh, so maybe a phone call, face-to-face -face conversation might be a little more sufficient uh, depending upon what we're talking about. Uh, so managerial accounting. Uh, we talked about financial accounting and that it provides information to external stakeholders. Managerial accounting is for managers, people inside the organization. And managers rely on this information 
to make important decisions. Uh, they need to know how much is uh, being expended in terms of cost. What are the outflows? They need to have be able to establish budgets so they, they know if they're operating within the confines of the resources that they have. And so financial accounting helps managers do that. Okay, And management information systems, which incorporates technology, can be a source of competitive advantage. A management information system is simply an actual technology system that helps businesses categorize costs and determine how much does this really cost me to produce. We're going to go into the different types of costs momentarily here. Uh, but ultimately, simply what your you think your costs are, there might be certain hidden costs, uh, indirect costs that need to be considered uh, that Obviously, if you're selling an item for less than what it costs you to make it, that's not necessarily a smart business decision. Uh, and so you need to, to obviously take that into account, of course. All right, so let's move on here and let's go to the different types of costs. I'm just going to provide a brief overview. These are discussed in the text, so I, I want to try to keep us uh, a little lower on time here, and we're kind of running long. Uh, first of which is you have out-of-pocket costs. Okay, uh, Out-of-pocket costs are expenditures that you make, so things that you pay for for actual goods and or services. Money that's leaving you, you are paying for something. Okay, Obviously, if you're paying for uh, small products, like if you manufacture uh, tables and chairs, and you are paying for the actual type of wood that you use when you're developing those tables and chairs, that would be an out-of-pocket cost. Next, we have implicit costs. Uh, implicit costs represent opportunity costs. Okay, Not necessarily an actual cost, but the cost that you're basically giving something up. Uh, so, for example, you know, obviously, if you have workers committed to a certain task, that does not allow them to devote time to something else. And so, although it's not a direct expense, that's a cost, right? Because if you, during your workday, spend your entire workday with a particular customer, well, obviously your time is a cost, of course, but you also have to take into account what you could have done had you not been with that particular customer all day. And so those are what we refer to as opportunity costs. Those are very, very difficult to assign costs for uh, because you really can't budget for them. It's very, very difficult to do. Uh, next, we have fixed costs. Okay, uh, Fixed costs do not change with the level of production. Okay, Meaning that if you sell 10,000 units, fixed costs are the same. If you sell 2,000 units, your fixed costs are the same to a certain extent. Okay, And, and I say that because everything has obviously an exception to it, but generally speaking, fixed costs do not change. Examples of fixed costs are things like rent, your lease, right? No matter what you sell, you still have to pay for the place that you're doing business out of, whether you sell 10,000 units or you don't sell any, you still have to pay it. There are things like utilities and other things that represent costs. Insurance represents costs. Uh, so those are fixed. They do not change with the volume of business that you do. If you sell more, they're the same. You sell less, they're still the same. Uh, now, the opposite of that are what we call variable costs. And variable costs will rise and, and vary uh, when the firm produces or business produces goods and services. Okay. So, for example, let's take a, a business like, uh, like a Subway or Quiznos, whichever you prefer. And I don't know what your personal leanings are towards. Usually I get students that are you know, completely Subway or Quiznos, and the other one is, is completely dead to me. Uh, but let's say for just an example, pick either one, whatever you choose. Now, there are variable costs associated with that business, right? First off, the fixed costs, they typically are in locations, right? So you have to pay for the actual building. You typically have to pay for to heat it, to cool it, insurance and those types of things. Those you pay regardless if you sell sandwiches or not. But variable costs are things like the ingredients in the sandwiches, right? If you sell four sandwiches, then you obviously have more bread, you have more condiments, more ingredients, uh, deli meat, cheese, peppers, whatever it is that you prefer on a particular sandwich or that comes off it. Um, variable costs are directly associated with producing that. Okay, And so that has to be considered. right? The more you produce, 
the more variable costs go up. The less you produce, the less your variable costs. Hope that clarifies. Uh, so obviously companies go to great lengths to try to determine if they're ac accounting for their costs accurately. Right? We want to make sure that if it's an expense that we account for it. But companies also want to allocate expenses towards specific products and I'm going to go into what I mean by that. So first off, uh, we have uh, direct costs and indirect costs. Okay, uh, So a direct cost is a cost that can be directly traced to the production of a product. Remember we talked about building sandwiches and all the ingredients that go into that. That's pretty easy to, to trace, right? Because if I make a certain sandwich a certain way, I know what goes into it, roughly how much of the ingredients I use. I can determine how much it costs me per sandwich to sell that. Very easy. What isn't easy is the indirect costs. And the indirect costs are the costs that are not directly tied to the production of a product, right? Things like management, okay? How do you allocate management? Where do they go? It's very tough to do. Right? Do we simply take their salary, divide it by the number of people or the number of products that we produce and then allocate that expense equally among the products? That's a pretty easy way to do it. But really, what if their time is devoted more to one product than the other? Why should they be divided evenly? Why shouldn't one more of the product or more of the product that they spend their time on, why shouldn't that cost be allocated there? Particularly if you deal with profitability in business units, and obviously you want to make sure that if they're spending their time in a particular business or a unit, that the expense is going there. Okay, So let's go through a quick example. Okay, uh, We're going to go through, uh, this is just kind of a, a basic method that some companies can use to allocate costs. It's based on proportions and percentages. Uh, so let's say that we manufacture iPads. Okay, this would be great, right? You're probably thinking, man, I would love to do that. So that's our business. We manufacture iPads. And we determine that we do three different businesses. We do iPads, we do iPhones, and then we do MacBook, Mac computers. Okay. So let's just say that out of 15,000, 500 of those hours go to iPads. So pretty easy. I'm going to keep the example pretty simple for you. Uh, and so what that means is if the hours... Obviously, 500 is a third of 1,500, okay? So, 33% of the labor hours, not labor's hours, labor hours, I forgot how to spell, go towards iPad production. Still tracking with me? Hopefully you are. So, what that means, well, let's go this first. Say we have five to $100,000 in indirect costs, costs that we have no idea where to put them, their salaries for managers, uh, different expenses like uh, insurance and heating costs and those different things. We don't know where to put these stinking things. We have no idea. Well, with the basic percentage method, we would say, well, the iPad is responsible for 33% of the labor costs. Let's just assume that they're responsible for 33% of the actual indirect costs. And so we would allocate $166,500 in indirect costs to the iPad division. But you might be thinking, is that accurate? What if they aren't responsible? What if management does not spend a lot of time there? What if additional resources are going to producing iPhones or Mac computers or whatever the case is? Maybe the facilities for iPads don't take up that much space. Is it fair to allocate those costs to them? And remember, it's important because a lot of businesses take into, consider, into consideration costs when pricing their products. And so if I'm allocating more costs to iPads, maybe I'm selling them for higher than I should be. That's the business uh, problem there. So uh, let's go over ABC costing. ABC costing is activity-based costing. And we're not going to go into how to do it specifically because that's outside of the scope of this class, but I just want you to know what it is. And keep in mind the example I gave you where we're costing based upon proportions and those things. But ABC costing is designed to identify the specific activities that create indirect costs. Okay, It's really mapping out what are the activities that go into creating a product and trying to identify all of the costs that could be created. Okay, Once those factors are determined, we can, or once the factors that are determined that drive those costs, then we can associate those costs with 
that particular product. Okay, and so that is the the basic idea is trying to get an accurate representation of the activities that go into producing a particular product, and then tying those costs back to the product. It's it's a great way to be very accurate so that you have an accurate representation of your costs. You can price your products accurately. It does take more time, takes more resources and more know-how, but it is a more accurate method of doing that. All right, real quick, I'm going to go through budgets here just for sake of time. Um, obviously, we know uh, budgets outline ultimately the resources that we have. All companies have budgets. Uh, we obviously want to operate within the confines of them. We have certain dollar amounts to work with, and then we have to obviously work within those. Um, so that requires some coordination between managers and employees so that they know, hey, this is how much money you have to work with. Budgets are also good for evaluating performance, right? We know, okay, this is what your sales budget is, what we project you to perform at. You obviously did not hit that. Let's discuss why. Not necessarily reprimand you because we don't know if maybe it's just because of the economy, for example. Obviously, don't want to uh, blame you for the economy. And you can also monitor progress with budgeting, of course. You can see how things are progressing and obviously make changes. All right, there's two methods of budgeting. You have top-down budgeting and you have bottom-up budgeting. And top-down budgeting involves budget preparation where you have your top managers and they really just dictate, here's your budget, this is what you have to work with. Okay, it, it, Not very fun, right? With bottom-up budgeting, you actually have the preparation that involves all layers or levels of management uh, because you want participation, right? You want them to say, hey, you know what? I think maybe this budget is not enough. This is the reason. Or maybe, you know, I think this is too much money. We think we can do this for less. Uh, you do want to involve some participation, not only for that reason, to make it more accurate, but also for the very reason of getting buy-in. Right. If you participate in the budget creation process, you're more likely to accept it and to want to follow it. And that is what an important part of there is of bottom up budgeting. It takes more time, but it, it can be more reliable in terms of gathering your employees and, and uniting them to, towards one effort. So now that we've finished talking about bottom up budgeting, uh, we're going to talk about some of the key budget components. Okay, uh, we're not going to go into too much detail, and this is really what we're going to end with here, uh, our time discussing accounting, both financial as well as managerial. Uh, we're going to talk about the key budget components. Every budget includes several different items that are very important and really that build upon one another, and I'm going to explain how this works very briefly. Uh, so uh, the first thing is you have to consider is when identifying a budget and by creating a, a budget, you need to start with a sales budget. Uh, and the reason is, is you're not sure how much you're going to produce or how many in resources you will need in terms of labor and, the, and equipment until you have a, an idea on what you can expect to sell. Uh, and this needs to be realistic, right? Because if you're going to take your sales budget and you're going to design your facilities to meet the production needs, depending upon sales, you're going to hire with the anticipation of sales. You're going to establish uh, or purchase equipment uh, in mind with how much you're going to do in sales. You don't want to overshoot those things because the last thing that you want to end up with are too many employees or too much equipment that is underutilized. You do not want that much what we call slack uh, from an operations standpoint. Okay, a little bit, a little wiggle room is sometimes beneficial, but a significant amount is very wasteful and is very inefficient. Okay, um, we deal with opportunity costs, right? And the more money you have tied up into employees who aren't really doing anything, and to with equipment that is not being utilized, uh, those are resources that you can commit to other areas. Uh, and so that, as we've dealt with opportunity costs, and that is something that continues to uh, continues to come up, it is very troubling. And so businesses obviously want to be realistic with sales projections. Uh, realistically, what do we think we're going to sell for a given uh, week, month, so on and so forth? Uh, and these are very, very specific because depending upon what you feel, you're going to sell and going off of historical data, right, is also important. Uh, so in the retail uh, 
business, uh, which I worked for a number of years, when we're trying to determine staffing uh, for certain times of the day, one of the big things to look at is, well, what did we do at this time last year, at this time last week, last month? Are there any other variables that could affect that, right? Certain events that would go on that would bring in more traffic, uh, events that would draw traffic away. Um, you know, obviously times of the day and those things. And the idea behind it is you want to staff accordingly so that you can meet demand and you don't end up with lost sales. Um, so that's really what the intent is here, to utilize equipment, facilities, and people most efficiently uh, and also make sure that you can meet the customer demands and serve their particular needs here. Uh, so starting with the sales budget, of course, projecting what do you reasonably think that you're going to sell over a given period of time? Uh, and then moving to the production budget, uh, what do you need to produce to essentially meet that that sales goal or, or those projections in sales? Um, uh, and so Obviously, if you ran a, a, a common theme, if you take a, an operations management class, uh, is to get put through kind of a simulation where uh, you run an industry or a particular company that's involved with manufacturing tables, chairs, uh, nightstands, things of different height uh, and, and width, of course. Uh, and so trying to anticipate what the demand is going to be. And then, of course, based upon that demand, you go to the production side. And you find out, okay, well, how many of this, these size, uh, you know, legs for this type of table are we going to need? How many flat tops that go into this type of table are we going to need? And then deciding, okay, what is going to be, the, 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 what's the composition going to be of the products that we need to actually sell to meet our, our sales projections there? And so you start with that, you move on to that production budget, right, determining exactly what kind of raw materials and different things are going to be needed there. Uh, from that, you can determine your direct labor budget, right? How many people do you need to assemble these types of products in order to meet your, your sales forecasts there? Uh, so that is another important part. In, in, you know, and as you can see, all of these are interrelated. And you have to start with the sales end before you get to production and you start with production before you get to direct labor because it doesn't make sense to plan for how many employees you're going to hire when you have no idea for what you're hiring for and for what the needs are of the business. Okay. Uh, you also have financial budgets. What we talked about previously was operating budgets, obviously operating being running a particular business. Uh, financial budgets obviously involve handling finances and those types of things. So uh, typically cash budgets and capital budgets. Uh, companies do a lot of capital budget budgeting. When you hear that term, we're talking about high dollar items, very, very expensive, typically long-term assets. Uh, so capital budgets, we're talking about building uh, large facilities, acquiring land uh, that goes in line with that, uh, large equipment expenditures, uh, you know, things like, for example, if you were uh, maybe a uh, an airline company acquiring planes and those types of things that have a significant expense, there obviously is a certain time that you can use those products for before they need to be upgraded and, and maintained and those types of things. Uh, but they're a significant expense. And so companies plan for those types of things. How are we going to finance that? Do we have cash on hand? Are we going to have to take out loans? Do we have to issue stock? What's the best deal, right? We want to utilize our financial resources in the best way possible so that we can get the best return on our investment. Those are very, very important. Uh, so those two types of budgets are very key when you're talking about financial budgeting. And then you have the master budget. And the master budget really brings everything together, uh, brings all of the different budgets and represents an overall plan, uh, gives you an overall depiction over how is this going to work, okay? So master budget's typically done at the very end, a uh, compilation of the various budgets. Uh, we're going to show you kind of what this looks like here. There's an exhibit in your textbook, exhibit 8.6, uh, which shows the master budget process, of course, starting with the sales budget, moving on to production. You have your direct labor, direct materials, overhead costs, 
Those, of course, contribute to income in terms of the money that we keep. And then you have your cash budgets and, and balance sheets and those types of things. So that just gives you kind of a process flow chart, if you will. You can kind of see the process that it go that we go through or businesses go through when they're developing that that master budget and just really how important it is to accurately project your sales figures. You know, it really all hinges upon that. Uh, if you are forecasting uh, higher sales than are going to happen, which obviously does happen, uh, then obviously your labor costs are going to be higher and all those different things. You're going to be left with a lot of inventory, which is not ideal. Uh, and so that is, is essentially part of the dilemma there. Companies do not want to necessarily produce more than they have to, right? But they also don't want to uh, don't want to leave uh, sales on the table. They don't want customers that walk away unsatisfied because the company doesn't have that particular product or good, whatever that may be. And so that presents an issue as well. So it's a fine balancing act. All right, we've talked about that before to try and satisfy customers, uh, but also you don't want inventory hanging on the shelves and, and, and clogging up your warehouses and those types of things. All right, that include, or concludes uh, this lecture on accounting. Uh, I know in terms of time, this is one of more lengthy lectures, and that's due in part to just really going through the financial statements, and I totally understand if this isn't something that really gets you fired up in the morning, uh, but it is an important concept, an important subject to be able to understand these financial statements, to look at these things, to know what it is you're reading, to explain them, and to be able to interpret these statements. So my hope here is that you walk away with more of an understanding of what accounting is, also the value that accounting provides, and hopefully uh, maybe after a little bit of studying, a little bit of work, looking at financial statements, you too can be able to kind of make some sense of all the different numbers and things that are in those particular statements. So uh, thank you so much for, for watching and listening. I do appreciate it. Everybody take care and we'll see you next time. To the point to where you have a solid understanding of what we're trying to talk about here. So uh, that's enough about why accounting is important. Uh, let's go into really what it is. And accounting really most basically is simply a system for recognizing, organizing, analyzing, and reporting a company's financial information. Okay, We would all agree that if you start your own business and if you sell things, you're obviously going to bring in money, but all of that money you're not going to be able to keep, right? Because if you, say for example, acquire products from someone and sell them to a consumer of some kind, obviously you had expenses to acquire those products. Or if you're in a service industry, you have expenses to provide that service. And so accounting allows us to recognize, okay, this is a revenue. This is money that we've brought in. Okay, this is expense. This is what I am paying. But also allows us to organize it in a way that makes sense. To take hundreds, if not thousands of transactions and to organize them into revenues and expenses. And not only just that, but more specifically, uh, what type of revenues, what type of expenses. Analyze those, meaning that we're going to take our financial statements and we're going to assess the health of our particular business. How do we do that? And then lastly, reporting those, producing the financial statements so that we can publish those to potentially investors uh, and also other people that have an interest in the financial well-being of our company. Okay, so hopefully that elaborates on the definition. There's four basic uh, kind of key terms in there, obviously recognizing, organizing, analyzing, and reporting that you need to key in on. But I just want to describe the definition further so you know where we're going with that, okay? So make sure that you take good notes on this because sometimes it's not necessarily second nature, whereas some of these other functions you might pick up rather quickly. All right, so let's get into really who needs accounting. Why do we even care about it? Why do we teach it? Is it really just to bore you? Not necessarily. It does have a lot of value. So let's go through who needs it. Uh, first, obviously managers need it, right? If you have been in management with a company, you know that you need to know what it is that your business unit is selling. How much in sales are you producing? What are your expenses? Are you profitable, right? From a basic standpoint, 
if you are very profitable, then maybe that gives you the opportunity to maybe hire additional employees if there's a business need for it. Or when handing out raises at the end of the year, wouldn't you want to know if your business unit or company was profitable? If you're not, chances are you probably don't want to allow for raises. But if you are, that gives you some discretionary uh, income that you can then go ahead and dole out to employees for for performance, of course. Uh, So managers certainly need to know what products are selling, uh, to what extent they're selling at, uh, what are their margins, meaning that uh, what is the difference that you take home, your revenues, less expenses, if you will. And so those are things that people need to know. If you're starting your own particular business, you want to know how much money am I keeping? What am I making on each and every sale? Okay. And so those are things that you'll want to know as a manager, and that is why they have a need for accounting information. In addition to managers, stockholders, investors, people that put money into your company potentially have a need for this type of information. Okay, As an investor, I want to see how a company is performing financially. Okay, I do uh, some investments kind of on the side just for my own, obviously, uh, utilizing the income that I have and making sure that obviously growing that. Uh, And so that requires me to kind of pour over these financial statements of these publicly traded companies, which they are accessible. If they're a publicly traded company, meaning their stock is traded openly on an open market of some type, they have to publish financial statements like your balance sheet, income statements, and statement of cash flows. Okay, And so investors can obviously gain access to that fairly easily. You can gain access to a publicly traded company's financial statements on like a Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, and other different investing sites. Uh, That allows you to get a a kind of an overview of how the business is performing. How much money are they making? And then kind of develop trends and see, okay, the sales were this much this quarter. And now they are this much this quarter. There is a 10% increase. Obviously, that's good. But how much are they taking away? Uh, And so before you decide that you're going to put your hard-earned money into purchasing stock in a company, you want to make sure that they're financially sound, right? How much cash do they have? Have. We're finding that especially in kind of the volatility of today's markets, uh, that companies with cash are, are really the ones that are performing better holistically, although generally maybe not, or more specifically, maybe not on a case-by-case basis. But those firms, those businesses are better able to weather the storm. If things get bad and customers go away, they have money available, they continue to operate. Okay. Uh, Although it's always changing, uh, the latest report is that Apple has roughly about $118 billion in cash, Uh, more cash than anyone would probably ever need, and certainly more so than what Apple needs. They have enough cash to operate their company 11 years without making any money, meaning that they continue to produce products, continue to pay employees, pay for research and development, all these things, operate their particular business and they don't have to sell anything. Okay, So that's a pretty good position, you would say, right? Obviously, if you don't have to earn an income for 11 years and you can do what it is that you do on a normal basis, that's a pretty good financial position. All right, employees. Okay, you may ask yourself, uh, why would employees, I work for a publicly traded company, why do I really care to see what they're in? They pay me every couple weeks or every month. I don't really have a need for this. Well, as we're finding with unemployment at historically high levels and continues to be, uh, and, and people obviously being laid off, not because they can't do their jobs, but because there's just not work for them and companies are downsizing, you should show an interest in how your employer is actually doing, right? This could be a good indication of if you should start searching for a job uh, versus you know, continuing to work in that particular job, okay? It's all about job security, Okay? And so being able to read financial statements will put you in a position to where you can have an accurate assessment over how your employer is performing so that you know it can kind of raise the red flag, so to speak, and you can start in your off hours looking for other sources of employment because potentially maybe your job may not be there. Also a great way if you're looking at potentially working for a company to look at their financial statements. How are they performing? right? If they don't perform well, what do you think that's going to say in terms of 
bonuses and raises and promotions and different financial incentives that you would be able to receive. Probably not going to be there. Um, so make sure that that may be available to you. This is also a great way to negotiate raises is if you have access to the performance of your business unit, your company, and can prove that your individual contributions have obviously an impact on the overall performance of the company. All right, creditors, okay, people that provide money to businesses or dole out loans like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, JP Morgan. Well, welcome back. Uh, thanks for joining us again here. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time today going through the business function of accounting. And accounting is uh, one of the most important functions in business, uh, not to downplay the importance of the others, uh, but it's extremely important. And a lot of people, when they hear the word accounting, instantly begin to yawn, maybe roll their eyes a little bit, and maybe even uh, have some hesitation uh, because it, it can be somewhat of an intimidating function because it does require some type of analysis and uh, use of numbers, uh, which depending upon your background, that may be something you're comfortable with. Uh, but for many of us, maybe that's not something that we necessarily gravitate towards automatically. Uh, but that's completely okay. Um, you don't necessarily need to be the best at accounting, but I do encourage all of my students, particularly those that are involved uh, in entrepreneurship and potentially starting their own businesses, to be at least familiar with some of the major components of accounting. By no means do you need to be an expert. However, you need to be able to tell the difference between revenues, expenses, and all those other things. Because if you decide to outsource your accounting function, meaning pay someone other than yourself to handle the accounting portion of your business, you need to be able to determine if they're doing a good job or not, if they're accounting for things accurately, if they are budgeting for things accurately, if what is a expense truly is an expense, if money that should be somewhere is actually there. And so that just kind of uh, describes the importance of knowing a little bit about accounting. So what we're going to be going through here, just to give you a little bit of a roadmap, is we're going to talk about what accounting is. I'm going to give you a working definition, uh, which is the same one as the one in your textbook, just so we're consistent. We're going to describe who accounting is for, uh, the different types of accounting go into specific financial statements. Uh, so we're going to go through the three major financial statements that you'll come across. I'm going to tell you how to read these things. Uh, and then we're going to discuss uh, some of the latter uh, portions of accounting with budgeting and those types of things as well. Hopefully we'll address any questions comments or potential concerns that you may have after reading through the chapter on your own, which is certainly my advice to read through and then come to the lecture. That way you have at least a foundational knowledge of what we're talking about here. We can build upon it. If there's a little bit of confusion, hopefully we can get around that and make sure we get you. Uh, those types of companies obviously have a, a significant need, right? Because they want to know, are you going to pay me back? I'm going to give you this $100 million loan uh, for a certain number of years, I need to assess whether or not you have the ability to pay me back. And so, of course, I'm going to require a lot of financial statements. Very similar to if you ever have applied for uh, maybe a mortgage or even a car loan, any type of loan whatsoever, they usually want you to prove your income, right? How much money do you make? And so we can do some calculations to determine how likely would you be to actually pay us back? Do you have any other debts, any other expenses that would inhibit you or prohibit you from being able to pay us back. Okay, Remember that banks are very good assessors of risk. right? They, they pay people like actuaries to determine how risky someone is. And so based upon some preset variables and criteria, they assess you on how risky you are and are usually pretty good at determining who is going to pay versus who is not usually. Uh, we've seen the, the recent housing bubble and, and obviously by opening it up to some pride lending and all those other things ha has, has definitely had an impact on the economy for certain. Uh, but generally, they are good at assessing uh, risk uh, and those sorts of things. All right, suppliers. Okay, people that if you are a business that you get your products from, right? I have an image here of Foxconn, which is a supplier out of uh, China, and they provide 
uh, a lot of uh, supplies to companies like Apple, technology companies, a lot of the, the different things that go into um, or assembling uh, the iPhones and the iPads are done by Foxconn. And so Foxconn obviously wants to know if Apple has enough money to pay it, right? If Apple says, hey, we need to ramp up production on the new iPhone 5, uh, this, there, these are how many units that we want. This is the time frame that we need. Obviously, Foxconn wants to have reasonable assurance that Apple is going to be able to pay them. Okay, And so, obviously, Apple does, uh, but you need to analyze that on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, So, suppliers, another group that has a definite interest in seeing that businesses have a financial means to pay because they're, yeah, what you probably don't know is a lot of business in the business to business market, which means businesses selling goods to businesses, a lot of the, the work is done on credit, meaning that they may provide the goods, whatever they may be, ahead of time, but they're not really